This morning we're going to continue in, in our uh, series on the Great Emergence. And it's basically we're looking at the, um, the reality that we are in the midst of a transition in the 500 year cycle of the church. Where things get kind of crazy about every 500 years and the church struggles to um, find its way in a world that's changing rapidly and stay relevant to the, the people in this, in this new world. Um, last week we started to talk about the biggest obstacles the church faces in doing this, which is the, the cult of me culture. It's all about me. It's all about my happiness. We saw a little bit of how that has actually infiltrated the church in many ways. And then we touched on the, the, the reality that um, the reason that's backwards is the, the counter to the gospel. And that the gospel is about service. It's about serving others. It's about giving ourselves over to God. Uh, and the interesting thing that comes of that is that when we do that, and even science and research has found that the key to sustain, enduring, and full happiness has never been in self-service. And has always been in serving others and giving ourselves to something greater. And as Christians, we call that God, Jesus Christ. Today we're going to look at uh, something a little bit different, and I think it's it's very appropriate given the uh, the ASP theme of the service, uh, because the, the the kids in the you know, the leaders that go down there do absolutely magnificent and amazing work. But what we have to remember is that it is our responsibility as the local community of faith to help them keep it going. To give them a place and give them encouragement and to try to help them remember that uh, this, this is something that we want for them to be a watershed moment that feeds a daily, lifelong journey of faith. Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, an experience that provides inspiration once a year when they come back to it. And I think you'll see where we're going with this. Um, the title of the sermon today is Evangelism and Pews. Does that make sense to anybody? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time we hear evangelism, we think out there, we think bullhorns and, and beat people over the head with a Bible and dragging strangers off the street and tying them into a pew or something like that. Um, but, but there's something that's, that's a little bit deeper, I think. And as we look at it today, what we're going to find is that if we get a handle on evangelism in the pews, we're going to realize that uh, a lot of times evangelizing in the community around us almost takes care of itself. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So we're going to do this in just like a, a three-step approach. First, we're going to uh, answer the question, what is evangelism in the pews and why is it? Second, we're going to answer the question of where on earth biblically do we find evidence for this? And third, it's going to be what is a helpful suggestion to start doing this in our daily lives? So that's where we're going to head. Evangelism in the pews is simply this. It is holding one another accountable to stay off the fringes of our community of faith and our relationship with God. And to continually be more active and more vital in our community of faith and with our relationship with God. Across the country, when we look at Christianity, we see that, and we're going to use worship as sort of a litmus test here, because to be honest, most of the, the, the studies show that our worship experience is a very clear marker of where the rest of our faith journey is heading. That the less we're concerned about engaging God in a community of faith, system of worship, often the less God is the focus of our daily lives, day in and day out. Uh, and again, we're going to see where this makes sense in just a few minutes. And so, evangelism and abuse is paying attention to one another. And noticing when our friends and our family that are part of our community of faith, that are brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, are, are missing, they are absent. And reaching out to them and encouraging them to pull off the fringes and get more involved in the activity of the community of faith. And then embrace more and more the cause and do those things that lift us up and draw us closer to God and draw us closer to one another. Now, I want to say something here because it, it, some of us have overdeveloped senses of guilt. Is there anybody else other than me that has that going on? 
So you hear a message like this, and you're in church every Sunday, and then you have that one Sunday where you're sick as a dog, and you think what the pastor said, and you wonder if he should like bring a life with you to church. <sighs> right? Um, understand, you know, uh, I think God's heart breaks for those people who are in a position where because of illness, they want to be desperately in worship and they can't be. Or because of absolute necessity that brings them from heaven, forces it that they have to work on a Sunday morning. They want to be here and they can't be. Um, and that's, that will talk about totally different situations. One of the things that I absolutely adore, and many of you do this, is, is when people aren't here for a Sunday or two, and I see little bulletins slipped underneath my door. You know? And I get to see what other churches are doing. Uh, or, or I'm not going to mention names, but I remember a few weeks ago, um, I saw a picture on Facebook of a place where somebody went to worship that Sunday. Because uh, they were away, and I about fell out of my chair because it was so amazing how the work is. Um, you know, but again, travel sometimes takes us away from the community thing. That makes sense. What we're talking about is our consistent habit, our routine. Is our routine and our habit centered around God or is it? And this idea that evangelism in the pews is a call to our own personal assessment and asking ourselves the question of where is my connection to God and the unity of faith? And then also looking at one another and encouraging one another to continue to that journey in a more intentional fashion. Our biblical piece of this, we get wonderfully in Ezekiel. Ezekiel uses kind of a military metaphor to, uh, to describe a spiritual reality. He's talking about the watchman looking out across the way and his responsibility that when danger is coming, the watchman's responsibility is to blow the trumpet and sound the horn and let everybody know that something wrong is going on so that they can do something about it, so they can gather their provisions, so they can get themselves together. If there's, if there's a guard or a, a military presence in, that, in the walls of that community, they can pull them together, get ready to defend and ward off the enemy. And that if the watchman is slack in his duty and fails to blow the trumpet, then the damage that the community incurs is as much on his head as it is theirs. However, the watchman does do his diligence and make the community aware of what is going on. Then it is up to each individual to make that decision for themselves. What am I going to do with this information? Spiritually, it's the same thing. When we see brothers and sisters in Christ who are, are missing out on the fullness of that spiritual community and connection. It's our responsibility as watch people to invite them back in, to encourage them, and to lift them up. Peter says this really, really interestingly when he calls us all a member of the royal priesthood. So next week, I'll make a big priestly robe in Francis. Lots of purple. But what he's saying is that when we come into this community of faith, when we embrace our relationship with Christ and one another, we become a family. We become something different. We become something beautiful. And he actually goes and kind of takes this Ezekiel thing and reminds us of what that looks like. Because in his own community, Paul is writing to a Jewish community here. We can tell this because he says, when you conduct yourself amongst the Gentiles. Well, you wouldn't say that to a Gentile. That would just be where they conduct themselves. So he's writing to his own community, the community that Jesus first came to, and he's reminding them, saying, you know, the watchman has blown the trumpet. Jesus has come, and there are some that have listened to that announcement, and there are others that have rejected it. The ones that have listened to that announcement, the ones that have embraced Jesus, have come together into this royal priesthood, into this family. And when they live faithfully, do you notice what he says about the witness that they give to the Gentiles? He doesn't say go running out there and scream at them that they're all crazy and they're going to hell. Or he doesn't say do all kinds of obnoxious things to try to make them feel guilty or fearful because they don't believe the same way you do. He says live your life faithfully. Live your life genuinely. Live your life in love and grace. Let the gospel that you have embraced 
words fully, come fully into whatever you do. And that will speak to them. That will shine the light of Christ into the world. That is what transforms. And there's an understood component to that, which is in order for us to blow the trumpet, in order for us to have a reference point for where things are going right and where things are going wrong, we have to be as present as we possibly can. We have to know each other. We have to spend time together. And we have to make sure that we are setting the foundation where our where God, where our worship of God is central to who we are and who we become. Because then it frames everything that we do. So what does this look like? Well, I, I would like to make a suggestion of what this looks like and what we can strive for in our daily life is a basis of something very simple. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. Oh, we have dissension in the ranks. <laughs> Some say Sunday. How many of you have ever done shift work? 3 to 11, 7 to 3. How many of you had it where your schedule ran from Sunday to Saturday, not Monday to Sunday? That's because what everywhere I've done shift work. Schedule Sunday to Monday. Which means even in that secular workforce, uh, it's, it's Sunday the first day of the week. And, um, in early Christianity and Judaism, Sunday was the first day of the week because Sunday was the Sabbath. Saturday was the day of rest. So our first day of the week is Sunday. And I would argue that the way we start our week often impacts the way we spend the rest of it. Think about our Sunday morning. Think about this model. Let me ask you another question. How many of you get up before 7 o'clock a.m. Monday through Friday? For how many of you is 8 or 9 o'clock sleeping in kind of late? Okay. This is an important thing to do. This is important. Because, let's take our own community of faith. Our worship time is at 10 o'clock. I would argue that most of us uh, could sleep on Sunday till 8 or 9 and still make it here for 10 o'clock worship. Right? So our first day of the week is beautiful because we get to sleep later. Then, we kick it off. What's the first thing we do during the week? We go and we worship. We spend the first moments of our week in the presence of God with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're praise and prayer and we hear scripture. We get the word of God. We're in a community of faith together. That begins our week. It frames it. And then, what do most Sundays hold? How many of you do something family-wide on Sunday? Yes, no, maybe. Maybe you go to a game with your kids, or your grandkids, or you go out to lunch afterwards, or, or, or uh, anybody have a nice nap on Sunday afternoon? Okay, very good, all right. In other words, many times Sunday is during <coughs> worship and then family. And then maybe later in the day, after things are wound down, we start doing something maybe for me. And then as the evening rolls in, we have kids we get to doing their homework if they haven't already done. We maybe adjust our bedtime because Monday's coming. And so the order of Sunday frames the week. And do we frame it in a way that centers us on God? Do we frame it, God, family, something for me? And then we get into the business. Is that a different picture than um, sleeping till 12 and, um, and then stumbling out of bed and plopping in front of the TV for the rest of the afternoon? It's a little bit different. Okay? And my, what I'm saying is frame our weeks up with God at the center. Because if I'm at the center, or another person is at the center, um, are people whimsical or steady? Most people I know, kind of what happened, whimsical. Are people fickle? 
Usually we say yes, everybody but not me. Okay? People are fickle. And so at the center of my world is me or somebody else. My life is going to be either incidentally or consistently chaotic because I'm going to be responding out of convenience to whatever is going to suit that individual or me in the moment. And what that almost always does is it spells some kind of a problem later on for something that really needs attention. But if we keep God at the center, if we start our week centered on God, God brings clarity. God brings a sense of order. When we have our priorities right in line, not only do we make better choices, not only do we make better decisions, not only is our relationship with God more intimate and clearer and more informing in our lives, but also we are ultimately satisfied because we are making decisions that we are at peace with. And we lay down at night and we know we've done our best. By ourselves, by our family, by our friends, and by God. And that can translate into every single day. I want to encourage us that that's the beginning of our week. Why not make every day the same? Every morning, take some time and center. It's going to look different for every one of us. Some people's peaceful time in the morning is a cup of coffee. Some people's peaceful time in the morning is a shower. Sometimes it's your drive to work. And sometimes when you make it to the gym. But use that time to center on a simple thing. It doesn't take long. Some people, it's, it's, it's reading scripture and prayer. Take the time to center and remind yourself, I'm a beloved creation of God. And that creator is walking with me through this day. What do I need to do to prepare myself to serve that creator wherever I go? We put God first. And then before you walk out of the house, how do I say I love you, my friend? Is it a peck on the cheek? Is it an I love you? Making so many breakfasts, turning on the coffee machine. I can tell you for me, if I get up crazy early in the morning, the most loving thing I can do is not make any noise and yell everybody sleep. <laughs> Sarah's not in your pool. So we go God, and we go family, and then the rest follows. When we do that, we become more intentionally involved in our faith and our community of faith. And when we do that, and it's the very fabric of our lives, here's why evangelism starts to take care of itself outside of the news. Because when somebody says to me, what am I doing this weekend? What are you doing this weekend? Well, we had a soccer game on Saturday, we had church on Sunday morning, and then we had to have some more Sunday afternoon. You got anything looking for October? It's going to be fall. Uh, I know that's some craziness at work. Uh, you know, probably may get up to Robles at some point. Uh, Halloween, we have trunk or treat at the church. And suddenly, those things that lift us up and build that foundation in our community and of faith in our lives and for our children and for everyone else around us become just part of who we are. And those conversations aren't forced. It's just conversation. And eventually, somebody may say, What's that about? Well, we may get the courage to say, why don't you come and join us? What do you think? And the gospel spreads. When, and then, and I'm going to confess, I got to read this last piece. Well, when we make God in our community of faith, huge and significant priority in our life. We're building a foundation for generations to come. And this is what this series is all about, is building a foundation. We set ourselves into and up for a place of encouragement and accountability for one another. We made our call to reach out to those in our community and those who are on the fringes of our community. And our lives scream to the world about our faith in Jesus Christ and how it's transforming us day by day. To top it all off, the peace, this wonderful peace that we get by doing this, carries with it more than just the experience of peace. It carries with it assurance. Because when we put our trust and faith in Christ, that peace is not something that's just going to be temporary while we're here, but we are assured that that peace is going to follow us for all eternity. And I think that's something worth passing on. Amen? Amen? All right, please stand with me and join in number 261, The Lord of the Dance.